Think of HAL Laboratory and think of a spherical protagonist. That's right, Trax. Just over a year before Kirby was born, we got this interesting little tank-based shooter, the mission being to save Capital City from the Master Tank Master. Not a typo. You pilot a spherical tank with a truckload of firepower through four levels ranging from forests to military bases to caves. It's not an auto-scroller, which is why I consider it a shooter rather than a shoot-em-up. You drive your tank in all eight directions at your own pace, destroying a wide variety of antagonists, from the typical tanks and helicopters to more mecha-style baddies. A lot of the environment is also destructible from trees to hangars and so on. The guns are fired with B, and movement is controlled solely with the D-pad. You're not just firing in front of you, press A to rotate 45 degrees clockwise. This feature is the unique selling point of tracks. You can shoot in the same eight directions, independently of movement. It's a tricky thing to pull off with only two buttons, and you can only rotate clockwise, which might take a while to get used to, but honestly it's not that tough. The advanced weapons help a lot, and you can hold the buttons down simultaneously in order to align yourself more quickly. It takes less than two seconds to turn a full 360. The game would have worked really well on the Super Nintendo, using the shoulder buttons to rotate, but Trax is sadly a one-off Game Boy exclusive. There are five weapons, and all of them have their merits. This isn't like a lot of shooter games where there's definitely a best weapon, a BFG if you will, Rather, every weapon you can pick up has different benefits and strengths, and all are powerful as hell. Your standard gun isn't too bad, actually. A lot of enemies die with one hit. There is a grenade with a slow fire rate, but a massive explosion that deals tons of damage. A three-way shot that shoots your normal bullet with a 45-degree shot either side of it. You can obviously still rotate in all eight directions, too one that creates a duplicate of your shot shooting out of your rear, and a very powerful missile that plows forward through multiple targets. All excellent, depending on your situation. They all have infinite ammunition too, but if you get hit at all, you lose it. That's alright though, because maneuverability is so sharp, and the hitbox is so accurate, and there are many pickups hidden within the trucks or buildings. The look of the game is excellent, with HAL's typical cartoonish style very much evident. There's a lovely level of detail in the backgrounds, and the bosses are often these massive lurching monsters that circle you, needing skillful use of the firepower and the rotation to beat. I'm not keen on the phrase, hidden gem, because 90% of the time using it simply indicates a lack of research on the reviewer's part, like it's hidden simply because you didn't hear about it until now. Trax is, however, one of those that's not really spoken about. I had it as a kid, so it wasn't hidden from me, and a gem it most certainly is. It's a bit more expensive than your average Game Boy cart, but not so it's unaffordable. If I can help unveil it to more people, then I'll be very happy. A great start to the year that gets even better with the very next release. You'll see. Oh boy, 1991 is gonna be awesome, isn't it? You have no idea how high my anticipation levels were for this one. A regular bedfellow of Kirby's Dreamland and Link's Awakening on any given top 25 list is the first portable entry in the gold standard franchise of run and gun shooter games. Originally, Contra was released in arcades and then, most famously, on the NES and Famicom. In Europe, for whatever reason, the name Provotector was chosen, with a reskin of robots instead of humans. It's weird that the idea of humans gunning down other humans was too much for the European market, but it was okay for the original game to share a name with the US-funded rebel militias of mid-80s Nicaragua. This raised a lot of controversy at the time, especially considering that some of the levels could easily be interpreted as a Central American jungle. Of course, 
The game is thankfully unrelated to what was a shocking period of history, but it was a poor oversight on Konami's part nonetheless. It was changed by the time the sequel came out, but still. The original arcade and NES titles are one or two player, here it's just one. Taking place in the distant future, you control these two Rambo-style guys with massive machine guns and no shirts through various forests, up waterfalls and around industrial wastelands, basically blowing the living hell out of anything that moves, human or otherwise. Ultimately, you've got to seek out and destroy the alien overlord invader. The first two NES games, Contra and Super C, are undeniable classics and highly sought after games that are timeless. The Game Boy entry in the series borrows heavily from both of those games and more than does each of them justice. The side-scrolling levels are accompanied by the vertical, top-down ones from Super C. Wisely, the pseudo 3D stages from the first game were not attempted, and they look excellent. Everything is superbly proportioned for the littler screen. With brand new levels, it's not just a port, designed to accommodate for the reduced space. There's the usual endless cannon fodder of drones who run mindlessly towards you, amongst a scattering of unique enemies, and a whole roster of brand new bosses to fight. Nothing was merely copied here. It's all new, but unquestionably contra. Thankfully, the button mashing necessary when you had the pea shooter is not here. Can you imagine trying to keep the screen still while smashing A over and over? You start with the automatic machine gun and can power it up with a really cool exploding flamethrower, a laser, and the famous spread shot. In fact, the spread shot is even more awesome in this game, as you can power it up a second time for more rapid fire with absolutely no flicker or slowdown, by the way, and even more wickedly, a homing effect that causes all bullets to swarm straight for any antagonist. At first, this feels a bit like a cheese, but plenty of skill is still required, trust me. It's a tough, one-hit death game, but that's what you want from one of these. Life bars are for wussies. The controls are perfect, so progress is 100% down to your skill and response time. I personally think this is one example of a game that looks better on the Game Boy. Respective of medium, it's a bit blurry on the original DMG. If you can, take a moment to appreciate the level of detail in the animations of the backgrounds, the water moving on the first level, right the way through to the globular walls and flashing lights of later stages. The bosses look ridiculously good, with the first one being this particularly memorable submarine that's wider than the actual screen shooting up at you from the water while you have to run back and forth on this bridge shooting downwards. Similarly, the music is absolutely stellar, with some instantly identifiable motifs that sound just as good, if not better than the originals the tracks are based on. Konami really knew how to crank some masterpieces out of the Game Boy sound chip, and this is definitely up there with their best sounding stuff. The presentation and gameplay of Operation C can be heralded as a real pinnacle of Konami's Game Boy portfolio. It's mind-boggling how they pulled this off, and I have no qualms whatsoever about awarding Operation C a perfect score. Absolutely outstanding. O oh, daughter, thou art beautiful. Why don't we find you a husband? Good to know that we're firmly in the 90s now and chivalry is still alive and well. You guessed it, that girl's getting kidnapped. She's like a tomato or something this time though, as if that makes all the difference. You're the eponymous Spud who is, you guessed it, a potato, and you have to climb this massive foreboding tower, killing the constantly respawning enemies around the mazes while also solving puzzles and speaking to various foodstuffs along the way. There are elements of a Sukoban-style puzzler on some floors, but it's never anywhere near as hard or thought out as Boxel, for instance. You fight bosses at the end of each area, the first of which is a giant bell pepper. You can find a power-up that turns your shot into a version of yourself. 
Yeah, you're firing life-size spuds out at the enemies. At first I thought this was a glitch, but apparently it was intended. Also, you can pick up this playing card with arms to make yourself double in size for a time, allowing you to trample enemies without having to fire. The maze layouts could be accused of being a little formulaic, but the variety is there in parts as you go along. Some rooms have intermittent lighting or invisible walls to figure out. I suppose this is a cousin to Atlas's much more successful title, Quirk, in that the overall themes are there, and you're trying to figure out how to get through each room to the stairwell at the end, but it doesn't really feel like that. You're looking at the game much closer up, and there's more of a feeling of flaws blending into each other here, whereas with Quirk, the levels could be interpreted as being more separate from each other. The music is pretty well composed, a particular strength of Atlas, although it bugs me how the songs restart when you change floors. It's kind of jarring, a continuous loop would have been better. The soundtrack needs more depth too. The style is pretty childlike, as is the overall concept, to be fair, with very limited backgrounds. The boss fights take place in a solid black room, and I often don't know what's going on. There are many times when you're faced with a choice of exits to a floor with no indication other than blind chance which one will take you further and which one will send you backwards. This adds something of a dull longevity to the game when you're really just looking to get on with it. The story is stupid as hell too, aside from the fact that you play as a plethora of vegetables trying to save the vegetable kingdom from the kitchen invaders or something. You play the second level as a turnip or an aubergine, I don't know. And after beating the boss, you get shown a cutscene of a carrot called Gerrit Carrot getting shot at by a cannon. Spud, previously not present on this level, but whatever, saves him. The clearly depressed carrot angrily exclaims, I didn't ask for your help, I won't thank you. There's a particularly harrowing cutscene featuring the death of Arnie the aubergine. What in the green hell is going on here? For a distinctly average game, Spud's Adventure is actually kind of infamous. That's because it's often touted as one of the rarest Game Boy titles, due to Atlas losing the major party support they had with Quirk. As such, the rollout was decidedly limited, with the cartridges alone frequently fetching three-digit sums, and complete copies being astronomically higher than that. If you can find this for less than, I don't know, £10, which you almost certainly won't, by the way, then pick it up. It's not horrible by any means, and even has some cool parts, but the fact you'll have to sell your dog to buy it sucks a lot of the joy out. Gods, no, they didn't. Did they? Well, yes and no. This is a collect -em up platform adventure starring Dirk the Daring, rather than any excruciating port of a game that barely worked on the NES. The idea is that Princess Daphne, at death's door and with her dying breath, smashed her life crystal into hundreds of pieces. You, as the courageous but ultimately useless Dirk, have to collect all 194 shards of the crystal in order to awaken this knight, that the two of you may venture forth to vanquish the evil Mordrock. The game actually ends when you wake the knight, which leads me to ponder if a sequel was ever in the works. You'll not know how many shards you've found until you die, which is a strange oversight. Aside from the characters, this game doesn't have a whole lot to do with the original. In fact, this game is a reskinned version of an old ZX Spectrum game called Roller Coaster. It's still got deaths aplenty, but you're not really fighting anything. It's more a case of figuring out how to get through without the scenery killing you. So yeah, it's got that in common with the NES title at least, and here it makes more sense. Rather than touching a freaking door, it's spikes and pitfalls that kill you. None of the enemies hurt you, but are quite often usable as platforms. It's a semi-non-linear experience in that it it's often up to you to choose directions or find other paths that aren't immediately obvious. It's a little cryptic at times, and there's not a lot of rhyme or reason to the layouts. 
lots of moving platforms, and invisible ones too. Quite often you can step on a platform halfway up a pillar or tree where there appears to be nothing. With good old minecart sections. These suck ass in the time-honoured minecart section tradition. When you think of Dragon's Lair, you're reminded of painfully slow movement and unfairly unresponsive controls. That's certainly not the case here. The pace is nice and quick, and jumps are not that unfair. You get some shonkiness at times, but it's not unlearnable. Patience and consideration is your friend. Don't mistake me though, the game is hard as nails. The jumps cannot be controlled that much. Dirk travels the same distance with every jump, which is why planning helps. The artwork in these games has always been quite nice. The original arcade version, while basically a navigable cartoon, looked way better than anything else that it had been lined up next to. Even the NES version looked alright, at a massive gameplay cost. Dragon's Lair The Legend has some outstanding backgrounds with lovely animated details. Not a single pixel remains unused. Sure, this may occasionally make things hard to see, but the whole thing is very artful. The little signs you find along the way are charming too, saying things like, Pass beyond this point and ye shall surely die, and Lake of the Dead, no swimming. So, it's not at all like the NES game. It's absolutely gorgeous to look at, sounds pretty decent, and shockingly, it's playable. You'll die so much, and the controls may put some folks off, but I find something captivating about the whole experience. The European version is a little more lenient, with less fall damage and spikes not being insta-deaths, so maybe get that. On a side note, have a quick look at the Game Boy Color version of Dragon's Lair to see something that was as impressive on a handheld in 2001 as the original Laserdisc version must have been in 1983. It's a basically frame-perfect representation. Released on everything at the time, the Chess Master is a pretty good way to play the game we mostly all know. It serves as a good introduction as well, as basic rules and more advanced tactics are handily given in both the manual and game. There are a lot of configurations to set, including, most importantly, the difficulty. The biggest relief for me with any board game game is having decent AI, which apparently is harder to program than you'd imagine. Here, it's spot on. Players from beginner to expert can find a level that's challenging, leaving you feeling like you've learned something. Some of the other settings you can choose from include turn time, which colour you play as, the level of anticipation the AI has, and so on. It's quite in-depth. I'm not going to try to teach you how to play chess, but I don't really need to. Like I say, the game does walk you through it if you so require. Teaching mode doesn't necessarily give you obvious hints, but rather shows you the legal moves for each piece when you click on them. There's no save battery, but any game can be recalled at any time via a password. It's quite a long one, but then there are 32 pieces arranged over 64 squares. The possible different computations is maths I can't even do. In a chess game, you might think that the sound isn't important at all, and I'd hasten to agree. I want to touch upon it briefly with the Chess Master though. One of the few examples of digitized voice on the Game Boy is scattered throughout. It's hit and miss. Welcome to Chess Master is nice and clear, but the checkmate and stalemate, not so much. It's not too bad with headphones, I guess, but I always play this with the volume down. Also, there's a bloody annoying sample that plays after every move. Chip tunes would have been much better instead of insisting on overusing the digital recordings. It's far too low def to sound anything other than irritating. Honestly, you don't need a chirrup to tell you that a move has been completed. It's weird having anything at all. Other than that, there's no music in-game, which is correct. 
what else is there to say? It's chess and it's good. The screen is used really well and a nice attempt to render the pieces was made. Movement is easy to pull off. I hate when you've not only got to think about your next move but also how the controls work. Here it's no hindrance. You get what it says you get. Not a bad one to have in your collection. With so much spotlight on retro gaming these days, little is unknown. As more and more people become interested in the hobby, the encyclopedic wealth of knowledge about even the most obscure games of yesteryear grows even larger. This makes finding a game that appears apparently unknown to even the dustiest corners of the internet repositories even more intriguing. That's what we have here. Ray Thunder is a game I'd never come across or even heard of until browsing through listings on a reputable online marketplace, my attention was grabbed by a gorgeous looking multicoloured Game Boy box with a picture of a fighter pilot on it. I immediately dove into my usual go-to sages, i.e. Google, for details, and everywhere I looked, every one of my knowledgeable minions I consulted came up short. The only info I could find is everything that you see in that little box up there. The developer, release date, product code, and the fact that it's a Japanese exclusive. As you can imagine, I was fascinated. So much so that I had to download a ROM in lieu of the game arriving in the mail. So what's this game about? Well, I'm not sure. I have the manual, but of course I can't really read it. The artwork from the box isn't very helpful, it turns out. You're not in a fighter plane, for one thing. The first thought I had was a throwback to the 1990 Electro Brain title, Bionic Battler. This is a first-person shooting maze game, I don't think you're a person, though, whereby over 21 arenas you have to collect a certain number of parts, little tin cans with a P on them, or clear each of the enemies. Some levels won't have any parts to find, so you'll just have to destroy everything, and it's one or the other. Collect all the parts and you beat the stage. The enemies themselves are varied. Some are these mecha suit cyborgs that I imagine you yourself are. Understand my confusion in that you never actually see yourself. Whereas some are floating droids or other forms of mechanical constructs. They don't really come after you as such, nothing so intelligent as that. Rather, some of them patrol around in a small route back and forth or round in circles and some lie in wait to spring out once they see you. Fortunately, you're not blind. Pressing select in-game brings up a map of the closest area of the maze, and if you're in proximity, around four or five tile space to an enemy, a dot will appear on the map. You'll also hear a sound like a bouncy ball that gets louder the closer it gets, and also uses the stereophonic nature of the Game Boy to pinpoint a direction. There aren't many examples of that which spring to mind, it's pretty cool. Select is not just your map, you'll be pressing this a lot. On this screen is information about remaining enemies and parts, but also your fuel and damage. The levels aren't timed, but you have a limited fuel supply that drops as you move. There are a few restocks, but these dwindle as the game goes on. There are also health pickups, but these too are quite rare. The thing about this map screen is the game doesn't actually pause when you're looking at it. You yourself can't move, but the enemies are still patrolling their predetermined pathways and will still shoot you if they see you. Just be cautious and you shouldn't get sprung upon. In terms of controls, left and right rotate you through 90 degrees and up moves you forward one space. Annoyingly, down doesn't move you backwards. It makes you briefly look downwards, which, as far as I can tell, doesn't serve a purpose. You don't have to look at the ground to pick things up, you just step on them. Occasionally there are landmines or other traps, but these are pretty visible anyway, and it would be kind of useful not to have to spin a 180 to go back the way you came, especially when being attacked. A fires your weapon, but B does nothing. 
Some limited use secondary weapon like a bomb or missile would have been nice. Sometimes it'll seem that there's an enemy out of reach. This happens notably on the second level, whereby, according to the map, the thing's walking around a closed off area. You can hear it distantly and see it on your radar, but there appears to be no way to get to the blighter. You now need to find a keycard to unlock a path, and these are not marked on your map. It'd be kind of pointless if they were, as I guess it's supposed to be a kind of exploration element, but they're not usually too hard to find. There's barely any music in this title, and none in-game at all, but the sound effects do a really good job of setting an atmosphere. What I first thought were your character's footsteps actually seem to be a kind of heartbeat, rhythmic and intermittent. Once you make that connection, the game becomes that little bit more tense. The use of volume and stereo sound for the approach of the enemies is executed brilliantly as well. A very subtle and skillful use of a small handful of sounds. That was surely the name of the game here, as evidenced by the look of the whole thing. No scenery save the slab walls of the mazes, but a very smooth 3D effect with an impressive draw distance that allows you to see a good three or four spans ahead of you. I really like Ray Thunder. I've no idea what the story is, but it almost doesn't matter. I've sort of made my own premise up, and in a way, I like the game better for that. It doesn't need to be understood. The language of the manual and lack of any English information on the web transcended by what is a delicately crafted little beauty. One of the happiest accidents I've ever come across in my collecting journey. Based on the 1982 arcade game Burger Time, you play as gourmet burger chef Peter Pepper. Each single screen level is spread over several platforms, with numerous ladders connecting them. The aim is to walk across sections of these massive hamburgers, making them drop down a level, until the bread, the meat and any toppings are assembled on the plates below. There are a good number of burgers to make, with three to six layers each. Walking across the top bun causes it to fall to the next level, which creates a chain reaction, knocking all those below downwards. So it's quite beneficial to work from the top down if you can. That's not always possible, of course, as traipsing around the levels are various reanimated food products who seem to want revenge on our cuisinier. They follow you around slowly and kill upon contact. You thought sausage links only killed over time with a heart attack? These move roughly the same speed as you, and cannot turn around save after coming off a ladder. Even so, they can gang up on you, trapping you in corners and so on. It's possible to crush them underneath falling burger segments, but they'll just reappear out of one of several doors scattered about the level. It's also possible to walk across three quarters of a burger part, the trampled bits sort of squash down a little, wait for an enemy to step onto it, and then finish walking across. The enemy will then plummet along with the food. You get a number of lives, with collectible ones appearing. The collectibles are the only way to get extra lives, as none are given for points. Also, randomly these pepper pots will pop up. A little chirrup sound will alert you to it, which give you a decent number of points, and can be fired at enemies that are getting too close to make them sneeze and leave you alone for a while. You can collect what looks like a chocolate bar, turning you power pellet style into a food killing machine. Pea pickups remove all enemies for a short while. The graphics are simple but effective, and the same can be said about the sound. Nothing mind blowing, but it does what's needed. Later stages, of which there are 24 in total, are often larger than one screen, scrolling around with more enemies to avoid, but largely it's the same fare from start to finish. At the end of each set of stages, you're presented with a four-character password, so you don't have to finish the whole game in one sitting. Burger Time Deluxe is standard fare, not haute cuisine, but certainly appetizing. With more levels than the arcade, some humorous little cutscenes and a small story, this is quite fun if you like that sort of thing.
Riding the meathead wave of gun-toting action heroes comes a title that screams late 80s, early 90s iron and explosions. Fortified Zone was called Ikari no Yusai in Japan. It's not related to Ikari Warriors, thankfully, which roughly translates as Fortress of Fury. You play as two mercenaries, a man and woman combo, tasked with destroying the central complex of a literal fortified zone. The characters are interchangeable, which is necessary as the man can't jump and the woman can't fire the special weapons. On each stage you have a non-linear maze to follow, which are sometimes multi-flawed and has the feel of a Zelda dungeon. Some rooms only open their doors when all the enemies are killed, and there are traps and puzzles to navigate. It pays to explore the whole level rather than just seek the boss, as there are many special weapons and crates that hold health power-ups. Each one of these you collect gives your character, only the one who collects it, mind, another slot on their health bar. This is important because, although you start with 3 HP, a lot of enemies' attacks do more than just one point of damage. You'll often need to jump across spikes to get some of these bonuses, then switch back to the dude, who must have been piggybacking on the woman while she leapt across the danger, that chivalry for you, if you want some health ups for him. To be honest, I'd put most of my health bonuses onto the man as you're going to be using him for most of your fighting. Basically, the game tries to legitimize the addition of the female character by making her gather the tools that the man needs to do his man thing. According to the manual, I've never tried this, it's possible in the two-player game for the two characters to split up and take on different parts of the maze at the same time. That's pretty clever if it's the case, creating a unique co-op mode for the system at this time. The audio file in me really appreciates the Sound Boy menu option, which allows you to listen to all of the music in the game. It's the first example of a music menu I can recall so far on the Game Boy, which is great in itself, but the fact that the music absolutely rocks makes this an awesome feature that I really dig. Jalico were clearly proud of the soundtrack, and rightly so. We've got foreboding military-style songs coupled with fast-paced rock tracks that have some particularly excellent stereo channel drum synth work going on. The harmonies within all this are broad and very clever, and not at all cliched. One of my favourite soundtracks so far. The game doesn't look quite as outstanding, though, although the cutscenes are very well drawn. Everything is visible and nicely sized, but the backgrounds could have been changed up more. The field looks like the jungle, and so on, but it's functional. The enemies are largely all the same, but at least the bosses look pretty badass. The hitbox of your character is slightly too large, I would say. Also, I wish you could move and shoot diagonally. The controls are the only real letdown in the game. When jumping over spikes, for instance, you need to take off slightly earlier than you'd imagine, or else you're getting impaled. You can get used to all these things, but there's a slight lack of polish. Thankfully, this was improved in the Japan-exclusive sequel, Ikari no Yusai 2, which was much the same, but only had one character who could do everything. Done away with was the awkward jumping mechanic, instead giving the player several selectable weapons from the outset, as well as being able to maneuver in all eight directions. You don't really need to read Japanese to play it, so is one of those imports I thoroughly recommend. I can only assume Fortified Zone didn't go down so well because we should have definitely got the follow-up over here. The third game in this series became the considerably more well-known Operation Logic Bomb on the Super Nintendo, and that's just as good. If you don't count Motocross Maniacs, which was more of a stunt trial game, this is the first motorbike racing game on the Game Boy. Damashi can be translated as Spirit. This also came out on PC Engine, again in Japan only. At first glance, the game appears to be a quickly slapped together kind of thing, and the lack of a Western release would validate that idea somewhat. The graphics don't appear to have had much attention given to them, 
The music is ill-considered nonsense, and that engine sound, ugh. This has to be the whiniest racing game I've ever heard. Going back to the overall look of the game for a second, one of the key things to getting the image of a Game Boy game right is full use of the screen. With only 23,000 pixels to choose from, that sounds like a lot, but believe me it isn't, you cannot afford screen wastage. Here, around half of the screen in total is taken up by various speedometers and gauges, leaving the track in the middle section with little room for detail. The bikes, while proportionally fine, are therefore really small, with yours standing out from the competitors by simply being a lighter shade. However, once you play a few rounds of the game, this starts to make a little sense. Despite the dimensions, the overall impression of speed is excellent, with some nice track blurring, and yeah, the sound is piercing as hell, but the pitch slide certainly adds to this effect. In-game, you need to switch between low and high gear, and when I first started off, the sound actually reminded me to shift a few times. Using headphones, you can actually detect a low rumble beneath the winds, so it's not as bad as it first appears. There are four different bikes to choose from, all of which have slightly different stats. There's a practice mode as well as a two-player, but the game really shines in its championship mode, which takes you through a season of real-life racetracks, mostly from Japan. Suzuka and Tsukuba are amongst the names I recognised, and the layouts are pretty accurate. At the end of each race, you can put a handful of points into your bike's stats, choosing one of four areas. Top speed, power, body, and tyre. Power is your acceleration rate, body is how much damage you can take, and tyre is how long you can go without needing to pit. Win a race, and you get two lots of bonus points. And different bikes have various upper thresholds that are shown on the selection screen. For instance, the first bike has an initial top speed of 262 km per hour, while the second choice is 270. You do actually find yourself getting involved with the season, which goes to show that the concept works here. So, onto the most important aspect of any racing game, the controls. If you've ever played Road Rash, you'll have experienced the thrill of the centrifugal force effect, whereby you steer slightly into the corner and then ease off, so that you don't fall off the bike, letting the curve of the bend take you all the way round, pulling you to the outside. On the faster bikes in those games, the tumble point, as I like to call it, is an important marker to get a feeling of, knowing how much you can turn into a corner without the bike chucking you off. This is very present in Racing Damashi as well. Sure, the bail animation isn't as fluid or hilarious as in Road Rash. In fact, all your momentum strangely stops and you drift to the outside of the bend. But the physics are certainly there. It's quite easy to get a feel for it, and pretty soon you'll find yourself artfully feathering the D-pad to fly around these tracks without really taking your finger off the accelerate button. It's important to do as well because Taking any damage by falling off or hitting another rider reduces your body gauge, which lowers your top speed. Maybe the game doesn't look or sound the best, but it's still great fun with wonderful controls and a great difficulty curve. As you get faster, the game gets harder, so that you're not only battling the other racers, but also the death trap between your legs. It really does feel like a stripped-down version of Road Rash. Everything is on a flat plane in the same way that F1 races, and I was at first disappointed that there were no cars and cows to dodge, nor could you bludgeon your rivals to death with a billy club. But then you remember that this is a straight-up racing game, and those things don't actually exist in MotoGP. Konami aren't necessarily known for racing games, but they did exist. World Circuit Series suggests to me that it wasn't a great area of interest for them, however, as it's one that's sort of forgotten in the annals of time. Well, my philosophy is no game left behind, so let's give it some page space. You get a lot of options to customise your racing experience. 
you can choose F3000, Formula 3 or Formula 1, which basically governs the overall speed of the cars, but also decides the difficulty of the tracks you'll be racing on. In Formula 3, you won't even have to brake for a lot of it, but in F1 it's much easier to crash and is pretty tough. You can then choose one of two preset cars. They're both at opposite extremes, as in one is slow and handles well, the other fast but a shopping cart, so instead you're better off creating your own team. You can choose various aspects of your car, from downforce, which affects the control, your tires and engine, and so on. It's possible to practice tracks, have a single race, and in the World Series mode you plow through an entire season, firstly qualifying for each track, and then a three-lap race. So, plenty of choice there. Unfortunately, the gameplay isn't really what it could have been. There's a large information bar on the right-hand side that shows a map, your speed dial, and lap times. The map is kind of irrelevant as your current position isn't shown, and it's too far out of your line of sight to even look at it. I've never been a massive fan of these racing games where the tracks aren't actually circuits. Here, you're always heading towards the top of the screen, navigating left and right like one of those old Tomy racing turbo toys we all used to have. Compare this to something like Micro Machines, where you drive around in all directions, to see how a top-down racer should probably be done. The car controls in a very sliding manner. You can seemingly straighten up the car, only to have it still gently veer off to the side, requiring another single tap of the D-pad to actually travel directly upwards. This is greatly exacerbated by the level of tyre wear. After a couple of laps, your car is often nigh uncontrollable. Also, what's the deal with the engine failures all the time? It seems that in almost half the races you can be way out in front, only for your engine to give in, dramatically cutting your top speed and leaving you in your opponent's dust. You can pit to get it repaired, but having to make a pit stop basically ends your race, as none of the other drivers ever seem to. Another really weird facet to the programming is that none of the cars have collision detection attributed to them. You can crash into obstacles on the sides of the track, and later on you will do, trust me, but all the cars sort of ghost through each other as if they're racing the same track but in different dimensions. I imagine trying to overtake would be a massive pain in the arse if this wasn't the case, though. The music and engine sounds are genuinely brilliant. It's perfect racing music with a fast bass line and soaring melody, although more variation would have been good. Compared to Racing Damashi, it's a massive improvement. The look is a little rushed, I think. All the cars look identical and there's very little variation, but what's there is professional at least. The pit and podium animations are a nice touch. You'd expect no less from a Konami title. World Circuit Series is certainly not the worst racing game out there, but there are too many irritants for my liking, and I really don't enjoy the design choice of always heading upwards. That's fine if the camera aspect is behind the car, as in F1 race, but it doesn't really suit a top-down perspective. North American exclusive, The Game of Harmony is a port of a late 80s game by the assembly line called E-Motion, or sometimes known as Sphericule. You control a spaceship, well, it's a white circle with a black arrow inside it, and need to nudge or otherwise corral pairs of darker circles together and make them touch. They then eliminate, with the aim of each level to get rid of all pairs. There are three colours of globe to match up. They have a triangle, diamond, or square inside on the Game Boy version. And if two non-matching globes come into contact with each other, they spawn smaller globules of the third type. So for instance, if a square touches a triangle, small diamond pods will be generated. You can collect these while they're still small for a little health bonus, otherwise they'll eventually turn into normal-sized ones. The globes are somewhat volatile, if you don't match them up in time, they explode and damage your ship. This isn't necessarily death, but it does so much damage that it's as good as. Some can be connected by strings which kind of drag each other around, 
But an interesting game mechanic is that the levels wrap around in all four directions. If a circle or your ship goes off the top of the screen, it will appear in the bottom of the screen, similar to how it works in Asteroids. It may take a little time to wrap your head around. Cheap pun, sorry. The selling point of the game is the kinetics involved. Your ship's controls are polar, whereby holding left or right rotates the ship and A propels you forward. You can flip over 180 degrees by pressing B, and the movement is very momentum-based. Objects collide and interact with each other very realistically, with velocities transferring in an accurate particulate fashion. There are 50 levels of ever-increasing difficulty, each with solid sections in various shapes acting as obstacles. Half the challenge is driving your craft without crashing. You don't take damage, but you pinball all over the place, which can send you careering into orbs that you didn't mean to, resulting in a load of spawns that you just don't have time to get rid of. Movement isn't exactly smooth or rapid either, due to the limitations of the system. This game was probably biggest and most successful on home computers. ZX Spectrum, Atari ST, Commodore 64, and MS-DOS all had good ports. The amount of moving and interacting objects on screen was probably too much of a computational stretch for the memory of our little handheld buddy. Not only is it very cramped and tough to make out pairs, but also means no memory could be spared for in-game music. The sound effects are as basic as they come, and pretty nasty. Moreover though, when there are seven or eight pairs of globes, all of which need to interact independently with each other object on screen, as well as your own ship, there are just too many calculations for the Game Boy to cope with, and it renders the Game of Harmony way too slow and sluggish to play, with any level of success. A nice game on paper, and on computers, but this port doesn't really work. Choose your superstar and take on the All-Star Challenge in this one-on-one -on -one basketball game based on the NBA 1991-92 season. There are lots of different players to choose from in-game. I believe there's someone from each team in the league from that season. Pick your favorite and your opponent, then choose from five different styles of play. The first game is a one-on-one -on -one challenge, whereby you and your opponent try to score a basket. One person starts with the ball and the other on defense. If you have the ball, press A to jump, and then again when you're at the optimal height. The height depends on your distance from the net, and you'll obviously need to learn it yourself. Slam dunks are possible as well if you're in the correct position, but for some reason you press B to do this rather than A. While on defense, press A to attempt a block, and B to try and steal. If you jump and don't shoot, you get called up for traveling. There are other penalties as well. It's possible to charge at a defending player or block an attacker, as well as running out of shot time. There's a free throw competition which you play on your own. There's a crosshair moving around the backboard, and you have to fight against it somewhat to get it smack bang in the center. There's only one spot where you can make the shot. This will keep you entertained for all of a minute at best. Thirdly, you can play a game of horse, which is where you and your opponent alternate shots from various places around the court, trying not to miss. Every time either one of you misses a basket, you get another letter from the word horse. If you completely spell out the word, you lose. You start the game and must first choose a place on the court to shoot from. Make the shot, and your opponent then has to try to make the same shot from that place. If he does, then you go again from a different spot. A similar game mode is the Accuracy Shootout. This plays basically the same as Horse, except this time you're playing against the clock instead of an opponent. You need to make as many shots as possible within the time limit. That's it. You can select whether to choose your own spots or have to aim from randomly designated marks. Tournament mode is the same as the one-on-one -on -one mode, but you choose eight players instead of two, and the game proceeds in a knockout tournament until a winner is crowned. 
That's the whole affair right there. The intro music is nice, but there's nothing in-game, which feels very empty. Graphically, the game is a letdown. There's only one court with the barest minimum level of detail. Pretty much just lines on the court. There aren't any discernible differences between the characters. They all look the same height in-game, and they all play identically, which is a bit of a shame. I won't be losing a great deal of sleep over that, though. All-Star Challenge may have provided a small degree of novelty for basketball fans, but other than that, there's little appeal. So much so that I can't even be bothered to think of a witty pun to finish the review. Pass. One day, Doraemon and Nobita were playing with a time machine computer with their friends, when all of a sudden, smoke started pouring out of it. It exploded, knocking poor Doraemon out. When he came to, he found himself in a mysterious maze. Here, he meets a Chibika angel, who asks for his help in finding the angel's missing friends. In exchange, the angel will help you look for your special tool, stop it, which Doraemon can use to get home. You walk along these paths that look like really long scrolls floating in space. There are monsters with you which are instant death on contact, though you can use an extendable power glove to punch some of them away. Hidden about the maze are these doors, some of which teleport you elsewhere, others which you need to peek in. You're looking for three missing angel things that'll help you return home. If it's a wrong door, Doraemon will complain that it's a really messy room and nothing will happen. In one such door, the angel will appear and tell you that you can see where else to go by pressing select. This then brings up a useful radar. Behind some doors, the angel will tell you that he saw something circular. Doraemon exclaims this must be his special tool, and you enter a vertically scrolling shoot 'em up You only have the punch attack at first, though this can be upgraded to an actual gun or a powerful boomerang that can take out multiple enemies. There's also a rapid-fire gun that's extremely powerful. You can collect a shield that can absorb several hits, and you can jump to avoid stuff. Get to the end of these stages, no small task, believe me, and there'll be yet another door, in which will be a reward. This could be extra lives, or it could be part of the tool you're looking for. The cool thing you'll find if you survive these stages is, whatever weapon you were holding at the end, you now have on the maze screen greatly helping your progress in this overworld area. The vertical shoot 'em up stages aren't the only ones. Occasionally, you'll find a horizontally scrolling one as well. The same concept applies here, with more emphasis on having to jump. It's impressive that they managed to create two pretty good interpretations of both 2D shoot 'em up variants. Doraemon had way more than his fair share of Game Boy titles. Granted, a lot of them were study guides released late in the Game Boy's life, but that is testament to what a popular character he is. Aside from those kanji and mathematics cartridges, he also had a small collection of what turned out to be surprisingly good games. Don't worry too much if you can't read the story here, as it's not that difficult to elicit what you need to do just by wandering around. Doraemon Secret Doggy Showdown was a really pleasant surprise, one that I played to completion. Curiously, we have not one, but two throwbacks to earlier Game Boy titles with Ninja Taro. If you remember Maru's mission from a little while ago, you may recall that I said that it was the only Ninja Jajamarakun game released in the West. And it is, but Ninja Taro is related, if only loosely. The more intriguing link is a more historical one. The game is set in feudal Japan, at the time when Lord Takeda Shingen was pronounced dead. The country's biggest enemy, one Oda Nobunaga, started to become ambitious, and started talking about unifying all of Japan under his leadership. 
as the most valiant ninja, help Lord Nobu in his quest to rid the last vestiges of evil and unite the entire country. Unlike Nobunaga's ambition, this is not a strategy game, but actually an action RPG. It's quite a simplistic one, as there's no real levelling up system, nor is there much puzzle solving or currency in the game. Character improvements are made by finding things like sword, shuriken, and health upgrades in the overworld. A lot of the action takes place in the overworld, with very little story progression taking place in towns or villages. Most NPCs are not so helpful, conversation is not their strong point, but you do need to speak to them as there's usually one in any new place that acts as a trigger point, giving you some quest or pointer where to go next. There are a couple when you get to the main hub where the king lives that'll give you certain consumables to progress. These are few but necessary, and act as the directors of the game in that some aren't immediately available but need to be unlocked, so to speak. This is something that Zelda games do with great aplomb, of course. For instance, you need the hookshot or flippers or whatever to be able to do X and Y. In Ninja Taro, there aren't nearly as many, nor are their applications as wide-ranging, but they're there nonetheless. Something called water spiders allow you to cross narrow sections of river, and ladders help you scale and descend cliff faces. You can hold up to 15 of these at any time, and it's good to learn which enemies allow you to farm them, and stock up before embarking on any large quests. It really sucks to get 90% of the way into a dungeon, only to run out of water spiders and not be able to reach the final boss. Other collectibles are found in chests all over the place. Some raise the power of your end sword, some your Murasame, a slightly different sword, some improve your throwing stars, that sort of thing. Other pickups include herbs and potions that heal you, bombs that can be used offensively, and spells that cloak you in fire or make you blend into the scenery. There are also key items that you need to find. Often these are held by a boss and include things like scrolls, important plot points, keys, and a sorrow crystal that is used to destroy an ogre later on. Your soundtrack is very good, musically at least. There aren't too many sound effects, but the songs are well composed with a nice variety. The graphics err on the side of utility a lot of the time. They're decent enough, although your character looks like a chubby monk, even though he's supposed to be a ninja. The enemy variation is pretty good, and they all have their own movement patterns and strengths. There are some great cutscenes though, which provide a delightful respite from both the unrelenting action and the monotonous overworlds. Expect to see quite a bit of tile repetition. That's not such a big deal on an 8-bit system, of course, and the game is pretty huge. It's a long slog, actually, one that I'm yet to finish off. It's easy to forget that this game was at least loosely based in actual human history. The story is great, though, and the telling of it captivating. That's as important as anything in a grand adventure. What at first appears to be a game in a similar vein to Pipe Mania or Bloodier is actually something a little different. Loops was designed for the Atari ST originally, and amongst a plethora of home computer versions, including the ZX Spectrum, DOS and Amiga, there was also an NES port as well as this one. You have an 18x7 grid in which random pieces of pipes need to be placed in order to create full circuits. There's a time limit to place each piece on the grid, which at first is easy enough, but once the grid starts getting more cluttered, it becomes tougher. You have three lives, which are lost if you fail to place a piece within the time limit. Loops don't have to be circular by any means. You can make them any size and shape, as long as a complete circuit is made. Complete the circuit, and those pieces are removed, with the larger loops giving more points. There's a similar risk-reward concept to that which you'd find in Tetris, whereby trying to hold on to get that perfect piece to complete what you're trying to do can garner the biggest scores. Some pieces are just one tile, with straight pieces or corners, and can be rotated to any of the four directions you need. 
There are larger pieces as well, such as straight sections that are three blocks long, a larger corner, a U-bend, and an often awkward chicane piece. You can also get bombs which can destroy an entire half-made loop. Note that you can block other loops if you need to, but the track cannot intersect with the outermost edge. You can place pieces right at the edge, as long as the track is not touching it. There aren't a lot of rules to follow, really, but the game takes a little practice to get good at. My biggest hampering factor when starting out was my ambition, trying to create massive, elaborate loops which got unmanageable pretty quickly. You're better off sticking to smaller ones at first, else you can be stuck waiting for a certain shape and getting all these silly ones that you just can't put anywhere without messing up. If you take up a large part of the playfield with one loop, you're banking a lot on being able to get rid of it. Those lives will drop pretty quickly. There are three game modes. Game A follows the basic loops rule set that I explained above. You can choose a level, the amount of time per move you're allowed, and the game goes on until you run out of lives. Game B follows the same rules, except you're given a bonus score to meet. The game goes on until you hit that score, then it increases. If you can hit the bonus score with one loop, then you go to a bonus stage. The bonus stage is one level of Game C. And game C is totally different. You're presented with a pre-made shape, which is disassembled in front of you piece by piece, and you have to memorize and rebuild it. I'm not as keen on this mode, as it's a memory game rather than a skill one. The music is well composed, quite sinister sounding rather than a jolly jaunt that usually accompanies games like this, and there are three tracks to choose from. The game is unhindered by its presentation. You can see everything just fine, but it's unspectacular. Loops is good for a while, despite its learning curve, but whether or not the one-dimensional gameplay stands up to its peers such as Tetris is for history to decide. I'm not so sure it has a great deal of lasting appeal. Blast off and strike the evil Baido Empire. One of the quintessential shoot-em-ups, R-Type is one of those that found its way from the arcades onto pretty much everything. There aren't many libraries that this doesn't appear in, and the Game Boy got numbers 1 and 2. There are only 6 stages on the Game Boy version, rather than the 8 found in most versions. You fire your guns with B. Unlike most shoot-em-ups out there, you don't have an auto-fire option. It's necessary to constantly tap the button to fire, so I hope you know how to hold the Game Boy steady. Rather, holding B charges up your weapon. The longer you hold it, the stronger it'll be, up to the point where the gauge along the bottom fills up, firing this very powerful laser shot that drives through everything in a line without dissipating. Try to keep this powered up to the maximum at every opportunity, because often a ton of enemies in a swarm fly at you in such a way that would be easy with the beam, but painful without it. Another of R-Type's distinguishing features is something called the Force. It's a small device that you get pretty early on in the game. This is a rotating, indestructible add-on to your ship that attaches to either the front or the back. You can, if you're careful, use it as a shield, taking out projectiles and enemies in your way. Pressing A ejects this force either in front of or behind you. It fires bullets simultaneously to you, and you're able to switch which side of your ship it's on this way. You can collect these orbs that also attach themselves to your ship, acting as shields. Believe me when I say you need these. They sort of trail behind your movements a little bit, but with some practice it's simple enough to keep them positioned where they're most useful. The Force is not just an additional game mechanic, but it's pretty much the most useful part of your progress. Your ship's weapons never really improve, as when you eject the Force outwards it'll fire any upgrades you have, but your own bullets go back to the basic weapon. In other words, you need to use this thing. There are fortunately plenty of collectibles that will strengthen what you've got going on there. Amongst others, 
there are missile upgrades, these diagonal laser show things that decimate almost everything, and all of these power-ups are handily numbered so you know what's what. Possibly the best thing about this force, though, is the ability to fire it outwards and direct it into a weak spot of these massive bosses. It'll do a lot of damage per tick by just being lodged in there, plus of course you're firing bullets as well. The bosses have a lot of HP so this is a very useful tactic. What we have here is an absolutely stunning looking game. There are fewer better in the whole library, with a gorgeous level of detail and tons of sprites on screen with a really respectable lack of flickering. I wish the great Chris Hurlsbeck theme music that was used in the Commodore 64 and Amiga versions was there. The music in-game is excellent still, as are the sound effects. The thing that gets me most in R-Type, and this applies to pretty much every version I've played, is my own piloting skills. Sure, there are a lot of enemies, and they all have seemingly massive arsenals, but there are plenty of shields that don't dissipate that mean you don't need to dodge everything. Sadly, these shields don't stop you plowing your vessel into a rock face or the walls of a narrow corridor. I do this all the time. It's a hell of a tough game, notoriously so, but I managed to progress at a reasonable clip. The first part of the game I came to that really beat me up was level 4, and beat the crap out of me it did. There are fewer enemies here, but a damn tough labyrinth to navigate, whereby these large meteorite looking things I'm not sure what they're supposed to be. Move along set patterns around this maze that you're auto-scrolling through. There's such little room for maneuver, and your shield doesn't help at all. You will die here more times than any other part in the game. It's totally brutal, and is the only thing that stops R-Type getting a perfect score for gameplay. I don't mind difficult, but when it's not your skill, but memorization that gets you through, I'm not a fan. You need to follow the exact correct path here, which you won't know until after you've been destroyed, to survive. Several times I had to put the game down because my poor, battered brain couldn't take the failure anymore. I persisted though, I'm not ashamed to say I methodically wrote the path down, and getting through that section has become such a proud memory that I'm actually kind of fearful to attempt it again. Our type is hard work, and I love it to bits, but damn me do I need some time off from it. Whether Kid and Konami were racing to see who could get their point-to-point -point F1 game across the line first, I'm not sure, but with less than a month separating the releases of World Circuit Series and Fastest Lap, you can see where one might draw certain comparisons. Where that one was a polished turd of a game, this one is a despairingly similar affair without the sheen that graces even the poorest Konami titles. It's another one of those racing games where you're always driving upwards. I don't like that style, and games like Micro Machines showed that you can have a top-down aspect and still maintain the feeling of a circuital track. Also, something that that glorious title, and possibly my favourite Game Boy racing game, but that's for later, managed is a feeling of speed. A racing game with no engine noise is missing the biggest open goal I can think of. Why omit it in favour of some cliched music? I've never understood that mentality. That's not the only failure in terms of momentum that this game makes though. You're so zoomed in to the car that if you're driving in the middle of the track, i.e. 90% of the time, you can't see any scenery on either side. And of course, there's no detail on the tarmac, so it appears that you're completely stationary until a corner comes. Of course, all the cars, including yours, quickly attain their top speed and hold it, meaning there's not even jostling for position. It's like you're all stuck in situ for the entire straight. The corners, when they do come, approach so rapidly as well that unless you're paying total attention, there's a good chance you're going off the track. There's no satellite or map to help you, 
nor any signals other than the arrows painted just before the corner. Qualifying first is pretty easy. It's usual to beat the quickest CPU by a good second or more, but as soon as the race starts, they fly off at top speed immediately, whereas you, of course, have to accelerate up to it. There's no way to avoid dropping from first to fifth before the race is a moment old. Once the front two or three cars shoot off, you're never seeing them again. Race a flawless race, it doesn't matter. They'll keep the podium warm for you. I can't really fathom if this game is broken or I'm just an idiot, but I cannot get the Nitro Boost to activate, no matter what I try. There are three control systems available, two of which purport the Nitrous to be fired up using the up direction, and the third using select. I've tried all combinations of buttons, at full speed, at half speed, while braking, while turning, while going straight, and nothing I do makes the car go any faster. It's clearly on the control menu, and the tuning screen blatantly says in black and green, Nitro. I've tried the US version and the Japanese version. I've tried it on my SP, my DMG, an emulator. Nothing works. I even tried taking a pit stop to see if that gives you one. Nope, just slows you down. That's another thing. Why was the pit lane even programmed in? You never need it. The opponents never take a pit stop, and your car's performance never deteriorates. So why put it in there? That's a surefire way of coming last. In the realm of what's the point in this isms, why are all the different tunings put in? Supposedly, choosing a certain engine to steering ratio affects your car's handling and top speed, but honestly, the one that gives you the fastest top speed handles exactly the same as all the other ones. Why would you choose a lower top speed, when even with the max one, you never have to brake at any point? This is a hideous car crash of a game, really. It barely even qualifies as a game, because even on the easiest setting, it's unwinnable. That's not to say the challenge is too high, it's that the game isn't programmed in such a way that makes it beatable. There are two explanations as to what's going on here, and I'm not sure which I favour. Firstly, the game is merely a collection of placeholders that was rushed out without any real programming being completed. Secondly, I'm a dumbass who doesn't understand the game. I've played thousands of games in my time without hyperbole, and I've given this one a good couple of hours. All I can say is, I don't think I'm being an idiot, but the more I play Fastest Lap, the less I'm sure of my own comprehension. No way can a game be this broken. I have to be missing something, right? A horse racing management game might sound like a daft concept, but remember how popular a sport it is in Japan. It's no different than the F1 management sims we get over here. Originally released on the Famicom in 1987, this was also ported to the TurboGrafx-16, where I can only imagine the enhanced processing power was put to excellent use. The aim is to pick a horse from the many on offer, and help to direct it to finish a track as quickly as possible. There are two parts to this. Firstly, you need to choose the correct horse for the track, and secondly, you have to actually help it get round. Progress is achieved by placing in the top four out of six on each race. Come in the top three, and you earn prize money. You can spur your horse on by mashing A, but remember that the horse has a limited energy bar. Expend it all, and it'll basically pull up. You can jump with B, which can help navigate over hedges and stuff. It behooves you, I'm sorry, to take the inside line for obvious reasons, but bear in mind that some corners can have mud or sand traps there, which massively slow you down. The management side of the game comes with the horse selection. You'll see various attributes to help you choose. Speed is obvious, as is stamina. Gutsy determines how well your horse will fare when caught in mud or sand, or when it gets jostled by other horses. Jump is how likely your horse will not fall over when you try to clear an obstacle. Turbo determines how well it responds to your whip. 
type is the important stat to look out for, as all others can be trained up during the game, but this one is more of a mentality thing, which is constant. A high type value means your horse will perform better under bad weather or track conditions. I try to choose one with a high type. Sure, this means that the other stats will be lower initially, but in the long run it plays to your favour. You train the attributes by collecting various tiles that show up on the racetrack. The five trainable attributes all have their own tokens, and there are also those that increase or decrease your energy bar. In race, the biggest hump to get over at first is placing your horse where it's not going to get jostled by others too much. If you bump into another horse from behind, you'll slow down. If the reverse happens, however, you'll get boosted forward a little, so it's worth trying to get ahead early. Family Jockey is an interesting take on both the racing and simulation genres, and although it probably had much more appeal in Japan than anywhere else, the game surely has its merit. Hey, at least it's not a gambling simulator. It's ahead of the field in that regard, if nothing else. One day, an eagle flew over the village and turned everything into a maze. Why, or indeed how, they did that is a mystery, but there it is. There are five areas, each with three orbs to find. Gem Gem is wandering around these mazes. Each maze is made up of tiles that can be rotated with the A button. Each tile has two exits and two walled sides. Some are straight lines, others are corners. You need to manipulate the tiles to get to these buildings. Inside, there could be gems, keys, or upgrades. Also, within the mazes, there are visible enemies and hidden encounters placed purposefully in your way. They're always in the same place, but you can't always see them. Battles progress as rock, paper, scissors. If you win a bout, it'll do 10 damage to the enemy, and it's essentially a race to the bottom where you need to drop the enemy's HP to zero before yours does. The upgrades you can find raise the level of your rock, paper, or scissors by one. This increases the damage a successful roll will have. It's an odd design choice. If your paper is a higher level than the rest, there's no real reason to choose anything else, seeing as how winning or losing is completely random anyway. There's no intuitive AI, obviously, so don't worry about switching it up. The game doesn't keep track of your choices and strategize or anything like that. The presentation is pretty great, it has a really charming aesthetic, and the sound is very well composed. The game itself needed more variation though. The battle system loses its intrigue after four or five screens. It's the same all the way through. There's no strategy at all. Close your eyes, mash A until the battle is over. The maze system is decent, again, for a short while. I'd be very surprised if Gem Gem can sustain you for the entire five levels. An unexpected branch on my intercontinental learning tree is American 90s game shows. Hey, as a man with an obscene amount of useless trivia stored in my brain, but virtually no vital phone numbers, I'm always up for a quiz. Jeopardy is a US general knowledge game show which has clues in the form of answers, and the contestants need to phrase their answers in the form of questions. It's not as confusing as I've just made it sound. Basically, the player chooses from a list of topics along a board, and then chooses a difficulty of 1 to 5, with the harder questions giving bigger prizes. So, for instance, someone might choose human body for $600. Then the host will read out, the strongest tendon in the body. It's named for the king of the Myrmidons. 
The contestants then have to buzz in with the question that fits the answer, so what is the Achilles tendon? The show is fun, if a little highbrow at times. Similar to Wheel of Fortune, the sound is just terrible. Oh look, it's by the same company of programmers responsible for that shit show. It's unprocessed, an afterthought, just rancid. I don't want to talk about it, I feel kind of violated by it. I'm an absolute sucker for quiz games, but even I hate Jeopardy on the Game Boy. There's so many reasons, too. I already mentioned the abysmal sound quality, but that's the least of my issues. It looks awful, really. You're always the same male character with the largest mouthed, most punchable face I've ever seen in a video game. Your opponents are random and all the same level of stupid. They too look inhuman. Rosie, for instance, always looks startled when she presses the buzzer and is clearly not the brightest bunny, giving the answer to the question, a single serving of butter for Mrs. Nixon, what is a ZWXYZ? At least make a vaguely educated guess, Rosie. It's ridiculous to have a timer in a game that you can pause. What's the point in that? Even in the pre-Google age, it wouldn't have been a massive stretch to get the old encyclopedia out. Nowadays, it's entirely stupid. The questions don't even get hidden, so you can leave your game on and call your grandma for the answer if you'd like. My biggest problem with the game, though, is one that should have been one of the first things to nail down. A thing that, in a quiz game, needs to be absolutely watertight. That's the controls. Sure, you're just typing answers, but Jeopardy suffers from a confounding and infuriating input lag, so that pressing the arrow moves the cursor to the selected letter a good half second later. When you only have 60 seconds to type out a chicken in every pot, this really makes a difference. Pressing A to choose the letter has the same problem. It's as if the game has a time delay between the controls and the programming. What's equally dumb is that you can't erase your frequent, hurried spelling mistakes by pressing B. You have to move all the way to the Dell on the right-hand side. You may know the answer, but if it's more than about 20 characters, you're probably not going to type it out in time. Come on, dev team, that's a pretty poor showing. For the example previously mentioned, I managed to type it all out, but the game marked me incorrect because I couldn't reach the end button in time. Would it have been so hard to allow you to press start? There were a few editions of this game, all US exclusive. It's one of my more embarrassing admissions that I own four different Jeopardy games. There was a sports edition, a platinum edition, and team tournament. Apart from the questions though, this was the exact same game. Seeing as how I have a decidedly sparse knowledge of early 90s US sports and teen culture, I'm only reviewing it once. Don't even ask. This takes me back. My eight-year-old self took such an evil delight in pointing out to my six-year-old sister that I knew more words than her. Who cares if I just made them up or they were spelled wrong? She's six, so clearly I know best. The rules in Super Scrabble are, as far as I can tell, exactly the same as the board game. You can play it solitaire if you'd prefer, which gives you a time limit to score as high as possible with just your own words. You have a choice of playing the CPU or a friend via the link cable. Each player picks a tile and the one with the letter closest to A goes first. You then choose your rack of seven tiles and have to spell out words horizontally or vertically crossword style. Any placed word has to work in all directions and must connect to at least one other word. Each letter has various points designated to them, with harder to shift letters like X or Z earning higher amounts. 
and there are certain spaces that offer double and triple scores for letters on them or a whole word. Play goes on until there are no more tiles left, or neither player can place a valid word down, and the highest score wins. What the video game version offers is exactly that. It's cool for loners to be able to play against someone, and there are five different skill levels for the computer opponent. Well, it doesn't appear that it's any sort of intelligence level. Rather, the higher the skill level, the longer the AI gets to work out their move, so I suppose the game is scanning through a dictionary at a certain speed or something. You get three minutes for your own placements, and fortunately the placing of tiles is easy enough. Select the letter from your rack with A, move to the chosen square, and then hit A again. The cursor automatically goes back to the rack, and then once the next letter is selected, the cursor moves to the next square in your word. Efficient and easy. Once the word is complete, press select to verify it, and the game will scan its dictionary to make sure it's valid. Bear in mind though, this is a North American exclusive, so remember to spell certain words incorrectly. You know, like, colour. Now obviously in a little game pack like these were, it is hard to store the million or so valid words in English, so occasionally it won't recognise a totally legitimate word. The programmers acknowledged this and trusted you with an override option, where you can allow the word anyway. Don't just plonk all your X's and Z's down and call it valid though, because that's cheating. You're only cheating yourselves and really, what do you achieve from that, eh? If you accept the computer's ruling, then you forfeit your turn. There's a lot in there though. I managed to get the word ergotic accepted, so it gets pretty specialised. One little downfall I've noticed, it's only happened a couple of times, but when the AI places a blank tile, one that can represent any letter, and they need to designate the chosen letter, the game sometimes softlocks into constantly cycling through the alphabet for some reason. This goes on indefinitely, and sadly the timer has stopped by this point, the only option being to reset. Apart from that, the coding is totally on par. I like that the entire board is fit into the screen all at once, very economically. You can just play the game without being hampered by the technology. You might think this is a silly point to bring up, but believe me, it wasn't always the case. The music is kind of annoying, but wholly unnecessary, so just turn it off. If you're playing this, you're probably on the train anyway. Don't be that guy. I really enjoy it when I find a game that was exclusive to the Game Boy, especially one that was clearly tailored with the system in mind. It's games like Solomon's Club that dispel any notion that the Game Boy was just a portable version of the NES, much like the Game Gear was to the Master System, but rather a separate console in its own right, with its own appeals and strengths. Here, in a throwback to the NES game Solomon's Key, you play as Dana, an apprentice magician who can make stones appear out of thin air. The entire game sees Dana trying to impress his master, Solomon, by escaping from 50 ever more tricky dungeons. It's kind of Dana's initiation trial, like the Aes Sedai testing in The Wheel of Time. There is then Solomon's master puzzle, should Dana succeed. There are five levels, each with ten rooms and a final room. The aim each time is to work your way towards the key, avoiding traps and defeating enemies, then get to the exit. Along the way, there are plenty of coins to collect, which can be redeemed in the shop that you occasionally come across for things like weapons or helpful artefacts. Each level is timed, and the limits are totally fair. Early on, you can probably make your way around the whole stage, collecting and killing everything. Later, you'll need to prioritise your escape routes, and note the places where you'll need to wait for the enemy's movements. Timing is very important, but thankfully, the controls are excellent and speedy. Dana can jump about two spaces in the air, which allows you to hop over dangers that are one tile high and wide. You don't suffer fall damage, but enemies can often be killed in this way. Create a block that they walk onto, and remove it once they're stood on it, and they'll fall to their doom, even if it's just a one space drop. 
Some enemies can walk up to and destroy your blocks, turning around when doing so, so this can be a useful way to hamper enemy movements. They all follow a pattern rather than intelligently coming at you, so puzzle out how to manipulate them before plunging in. You can also use created blocks to absorb an enemy bullet. It'll get destroyed in the process, but can give you enough time to get past the line of fire. If you find a bell on the level, a fairy, that looks like the one from Zelda, will appear from the exit and make its way to you. Collecting ten of these grants you an extra life, and there's usually at least one per level. There are lots of things you can buy in the shop, represented by a little picture. Some are obvious, but others not so. The manual is your friend if you have it. There are offensive weapons such as fireballs or water guns, a hat that makes it easier to destroy blocks from below, shoes that speed you up, hourglasses that add half your time back, and several other things. Some are activated immediately and permanently, whereas others can be accessed via the select menu. The graphics are cute and clear, with levels always sticking to a single screen. There are lots of different enemies and traps that you'll encounter the further you progress, and the overall difficulty of the game is excellently balanced. The password save system is a very good one as not only does it save your level progress, but your lives and inventory too, and it's not ridiculously long or complex like we sometimes saw. There's not a lot of variation in the music, but what's there is okay. Overall, Solomon's Club is a lot of fun with a perfect difficulty curve, and the pace at which new features are introduced to you is just right. There was often little story in these sorts of games, but it makes a nice change that we're not saving some kidnapped woman or killing a tyrannical overlord this time. A solid action puzzle game that fits the system excellently and should appeal to virtually any Game Boy fan. The clues in the name, Parodius is fundamentally a parody of Gradius. Made by the wonderful people at Konami, the game is replete with tons of other hat tips to many of their big franchises. You'll find references to Castlevania, Twinbee, that's where the bells come in, Lethal Enforcers, all sorts of stuff. I say the game is fundamentally a Gradius-style affair, it's a side-scrolling shoot-em-up with the same mechanic. You have power-ups to collect, which cycle through the different upgrades you can choose from. Speed boosts, a secondary weapon, option, the thing that doubles then triples your firepower, shields, all the usual things. You can choose automatic or manual selection. I always choose manual because I like to get the option boosts first, but if you choose automatic, you don't have to worry about selecting your power-ups. It tends to favour the secondary weapon first, then option, and isn't a bad choice if you just want to concentrate on dodging stuff. You can play as four different characters, all of whom have their own abilities and upgrades. Octopus is also called Mr. Parodius. He's an original character. You can also fly the Vic Viper ship from Gradius, Twinbee is the B character from Pop and Twinbee that we saw earlier, and Pentaru is a penguin from Antarctic Adventure, Cave Noir, see a few reviews later, and other things. The missiles and lasers will do different things depending on which character you pick, but all have their virtues and largely follow the same idea. A lot of the enemies seem to be penguin-based, which makes it kind of strange that you can play as Pentaru. And of course, the final boss in a lot of these games is an octopus. Wackiness has always been a huge part of Parodius games, and this one, which is very similar to the Super Nintendo one you may have played, has it in abundance. The famous Moai heads that always turn up in Gradius are here, but they seem to be wearing lipstick. The first level mid-boss is a flying pirate ship with a smiling cat's face on the prow, being crewed by penguins. The end level boss is the Penguin Pirate Captain. It's as if the developers asked their young children to come up with some of these enemies, and that's to their credit, as it's clearly a childlike imagination that's to thank for the delightful antagonists. The Twinbee Bells are here, and they largely have the same effects. 
Shooting them cycles through the bonuses that you get. You can't see the colors, obviously, but the pale one gives bonus points, the darker one gives you a smart bomb that clears the screen, and the striped one enlarges your character for a short while, allowing you to smash through enemies while invulnerable yourself. You can choose a difficulty and a starting level, but you need to beat them all from start to finish in order to get the good ending. Parodius may look like a fun time, but it gets pretty tough pretty quickly. There's quite a famous part on the second level that I, and I imagine many other people, got stuck on for a long time. You come to this narrow corridor where a sexy, scantily clad woman is stomping back and forth down that you need to somehow maneuver around. She's really tough not to come into contact with and requires nimble taps of the D-pad to nudge along in between her bowed legs. It's harder in this version than the SNES one, I think. The graphical detail is jaw-dropping, really, if you are at all familiar with the Game Boy's capabilities. They achieved all this without so much as a hint of a whisper of flicker. I'm no coder, but I've played a lot of Game Boy games, and I've no idea how this was possible. The music has a gradius feel for the most part, but there's also a couple of happy classical tunes in there. You get to this boss that's like six mouths who fire vampire fangs at you. This is hilarious in and of itself, but then the Can Can music started playing and I actually burst out laughing, so much so that I instantly died. The boss music on level 2 is awesome, high energy but in a 7-8 time signature. I say this pretty much every time a Konami title comes up, but there was nobody who could compose soundtracks on a par with them. There were lots of great sound artists at developers like Sunsoft, HAL, even Nintendo, but Konami's roster was always a grade above and beyond all of them. I try to take each game individually when I score it, rather than comparing it to anything else. It goes without saying that for a game to earn a perfect score, it has to be virtually flawless. I need to not be able to find a reason to dock a title points. Of course, I need to be as objective as it's possible for one person to be, and I try to be honest, although it may come across as a little ruthless at times. However, if I can't think of anywhere that the game could be improved, then what other choice than to award a perfect score do I have? Sure, it's just one man's opinion, but I feel that Parodius is as close to perfect as you'll ever get on the Game Boy. An unequivocal masterpiece.